production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Memphis Mayor Jim Strickland on his two terms in office tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight again with, by Jim Strickland, Memphis Mayor. Thanks for being here again. Uh, it's always fun. Along with Bill Drees, reporter with The Daily Memphian. This is part two of uh, uh, two shows that we are doing with Mayor Strickland. Last week, we talked a lot of current issues of the, the stadium deal, the arena deal. We talked about a whole lot about crime that's going on right now. We talked about MLGW, other um, immediate issues. But w Jim uh, Strickland here was nice enough to sit and maybe talk about the last two terms in office and even maybe some of your time as a city council person. Um, th there was a proposal at... Um, uh, what was it, a year ago? I've lost all sense of time. Um, a local referendum that potentially would have allowed you to run for a third term. Had you run for a third term and won a third term, and you were sitting here today looking at your, you know, starting, you know, another four years, what would your priorities have been? Um, crime, obviously, number one, and it will remain number one for a long time. And um, uh, we need change in that arena. Uh, there are there, I know there are things city government can do better because there's no organization that's perfect, but those are at the edges of the cr crime issue. The real challenge we have are the state laws, the federal laws, and the court system that has allowed for a revolving door and inadequate punishment, and I would continue to hammer on that until we got changes. And we talked a ton about that on uh, last week's show, half the show, I think we talked about crime and the criminal justice system and all that. And so again, we're, we're not skipping over that issue, but, um, but you can get that at WKNO.org or you can listen to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Um, let me ask you, again, looking back at yours, your successes. What are, you, what, are you, what are you most proud of? I think overall, I think our administration has, has operated city government to, to allow people to succeed and have opportunities. Overall, in economic development, uh, we've worked with all our partners. Uh, we have more people working now than before. Uh, wages are up 27%. Uh, uh, property values are up 76%. Uh, we have thousands of available jobs are open right now. The American dream is alive and well in Memphis. You can, you can get free workforce development and get a good paying job and a good paying career. And importantly, Poverty has gone down. Uh, it's the lowest point in decades and maybe the lowest ever, and it's been trending down for five years. 37,000 fewer people are living in poverty now. And then individually, we've done things that are long-term investments, like universal needs-based pre-K. That's a great opportunity that will help young people in the future. Uh, our Boys and Girls Club partnership, doubling things we do in, in libraries and community centers for young people, our summer jobs program, our Opportunity Youth program, giving those disconnected youth something to do, our gang violence interruption. We had a, 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 a meeting last night with, with gang members offering them a road to success and someone brought up the fact, well, with my record, I can't get a job. You can get a job. Uh, we had two nonprofits there, including Hope Works, that said, I placed three people with records just like yours in jobs today. Uh, uh, so the opportunities are there. And we've in greatly improved the built environment, I think, with, with renovating com community centers and building new ones like Ed Rice and, and redoing Gaston Community Center, which is now a beautiful facility, to the tennis facility, to the youth sports complex at the f fairgrounds, and with tennis facilities and golf and um, kind of... But I think it all gets down to providing good core services. And, uh, and I know I'm going long here, but Ned McWhorter was one of my favorite governors. And he had a saying that roads plus schools equal jobs. And I think what we've done is take that philosophy and expand it. Uh, roads means all infrastructure. Uh, when St. Jude said they, they needed to expand but they needed better sewers, we were right there and said, we'll pay for it. They've already increased their jobs by 2,000. They got another 2,000 coming. Uh, our, 
our uh, fiber initiative as part of infrastructure now. On the school side, we said universal needs-based pre-K. And then I think after-school activities are important, and we've, we've greatly increased that. And I think doing all that has resulted in real jobs. We'll dig into all that, but um, let me bring in Bill Drees. So you win the second term in October of 2019, take office for the second term in January, and in mid-March, this thing called the pandemic hits, hits the city and hits, hits the country very hard, an unprecedented situation in, in our lifetimes. Talk, talk about the impact of that on the goals that, that you just talked about pursuing. Well, it frankly derailed most everything. Um, and uh, it derailed our country. Uh, I remember I was actually down in Dallas uh, for the um, uh, conference basketball tournament for the University of Memphis. Drove down there on one day, they canceled the games, and I drove back the next and was on the phone the entire way back trying to learn as much as we can. And that Saturday, Dr. Manoj Jain came in and, and talked to our senior leadership team and kind of explained what this was all about. And then we hit the round, ground running. We set up the task force on city government, which grew to basically, I was gonna say countywide, but actually grew bigger than that with all parties involved in it, uh, trying to understand the, the disease and, and, and how do we respond. I mean, we just didn't know how fast it would go. I remember talking to hotels at the beginning saying, you know, if we have to move police officers and firefighters to keep them away from the virus, can we rent a hundred rooms? I mean, we just didn't know. But it derailed everything. You know, schools shut down, uh, uh, sports shut down, churches shut down, and, and youth became much more disconnected than they ever were. I mean, for a year and a half to two years. I think that's why crime has increased all throughout the country and in Memphis in particular. Young people disconnected from all good things, but the bad influences didn't disconnect. Gangs did not social distance. Mm -hmm. So the bad influences were pulling, so it derailed. A, crime was going down slightly, but it was going down before the pandemic. Uh, and as we've seen across the country, it went up. Um, it's just been worse in Memphis. So, so to the degree that you had control over some parts of the economy, you, you had to make some hard decisions when it came to shutting things down. And, and, and there, were, there were also some questions that, that I don't think probably anyone could have imagined at the outset, and that is churches. I mean, this is a city of churches. It's, it's, it's a known feature of it. And while you had to say, yes, we're going to shut down businesses, you took a different tack with churches and said, we're going to talk to you and tell you we think it's a bad idea, but we're not specifically going to, going to order you to shut down. I think that was partly based on, on legal advice. Mm -hmm. We weren't 100% sure that we could forcibly shut them down. And, and I was the first in, in, in this area to shut things down. But within about four months, my authority was taken away and it was all given to county governments uh, by a, a gubernatorial order. But I do remember what you're talking about. There was some discussion about whether people had the constitutional right to, to worship. And, but I think most churches actually did voluntarily shut down for a while. Because remember, we didn't have a vaccine and we didn't have medication to treat. Those two things greatly uh, benefited uh, and put the virus behind us. Um, you talked about youth. Do you think that in, in the disconnection in COVID and other people obviously have said that and the whole country experienced this, this, this spike in crime. Um, was it more that than, I mean, how much to the George Floyd, the horrific incident? I mean, that also, ha in some cities it was hugely impactful. Yeah. It did not, I'm not taking away from the horror of it at all in what I say here. It didn't seem like it had as much impact on crime here but maybe I'm wrong. No, I don't think a protest affected crime. I think protests may have affected our ability to recruit and retain officers because they were under so much scrutiny. But I don't think it affected directly crime. I think it was the, the shutting everything down, young people being disconnected, and the availability of guns that was at an all-time high, those two things converging. Yeah. And again, we, we had Jim Strickland on last week and talked at, at length about all the criminal justice systems and concerns about guns and so on. One thing, though, when we talk back and we talk about recruiting, and I think I've asked you this before, in, 
hindsight, were the, the, the pension and benefit cuts and reforms that were done, I think when you were on city council, because Wharton was, was mayor then, that the union said, everyone's going to quit, everyone's going to go. There were, what, 2,500 police officers. Um, and there were a lot of lost police. And there, is a lot, there are a lot of people who point to those cuts and benefits. And now the city, as like many, many cities, is putting huge signing bonuses and pay increases and increases in benefit. If you could roll back the clock, would you say, hey, if you don't do pension reform or don't do it that way? That's hard because it did, there's no doubt it had a negative impact on recruitment and retention of police officers and I think crime, but financially we just couldn't afford it. I, I do wish, there's a difference in the amount of information that you get when you're mayor versus council. And um, I wish our team had been in place during that time so that we could have figured out a better way to handle it. Because when we restored the benefits after the 2019 sales tax uh, um, passage, restoring didn't cost nearly the amount of money that the experts said in 2014 that it was going to cost us to continue those benefits. But was it a moving target from 2014 to, to when, when the referendum came around? Yes. I mean, it's hard to compare apples to apples because of the market conditions and so forth. but. Um, you know, I just, I, it had such a bad effect on, on recruiting and retention. When I took over in 2016 as mayor, um, uh, we were hemorrhaging officers and there was little communication with the officers. There was no plan to recruit. There was one of those years, maybe 2015, where there was no class whatsoever. Uh, we were hemorrhaging and it dropped down. We'd gone from basically 2,400 officers in 2011 to shortly after I was elected to 1907. That number stands out to me. We hit 1907 um, and then the, our aggressive recruiting happened and wage increases and we gotten up to about 2100 before the pandemic and then the pandemic hit. You talk about something that derailed us. It definitely derailed us. Older people just retired early in all kinds of professions um, and then the uh, protests happened all that stuff happening, it was really hard to recruit and retain officers. We've done a better job than other cities. New Orleans has the lowest number of police officers they've had since 1948. Minneapolis has the lowest number in decades. We've actually held on and now we're going, we're, we're rebuilding like we did in 2006 and 2016. We're in that rebuild again. We'll shift to, again, we talked a bunch about crime and, and those issues um, last week. And I want to shift to public spaces, and you mentioned that. You even mentioned, I don't know if you mentioned it here or, or before we um, started the show, the idea that libraries were closed on Fridays, which I, that stood out to me when you said that. And I don't think you said it on the show. I think you said it before. Um, there were all those small things like that that you did, I mean, to give you your due, you invested in. And then the big kind of gleaming projects like the youth sports facility, like the, um, the Lethbridge Tennis Center, which just uh, reopened. Tomley Park, obviously a lot of private money, but and all these had some amount of private money, I think many of them did. Um, within those, are, do you feel like those are on sound financial footing? Those were big investments. You also did the Accelerate Memphis investment of what, like a couple hundred million dollars. Right. Do you look and say, well, maybe that we spend too much or no? No, I think it's investing in the future. Um, I think uh, you have to do that. The quality of your uh, public investments has to meet the quality of the people you're trying to serve. And we have great people, we have great kids, and um, uh, they need that. The youth sports uh, facility is supposed to get a million visitors and they're on target to do that. Uh, Tom in Lee Park, first year. in million. its first year, yeah. uh, according to media reports I've read, and uh, Tom Lee Park I think is gonna be a, a huge uh, benefit for the city. And Ed Rice Community Center, it was never meant to earn money. I mean, tennis courts aren't meant to earn money. and and uh, golf course redos and we've put in probably a couple hundred million dollars in our parks when normally you know you only get two or three million in deferred maintenance all 120 of our parks have been have been improved to some degree um, and uh, uh, i'm very proud of the parks division and another thing uh, uh, covid derailed before the pandemic we literally had doubled the amount of kids taking part in library and community center programs and it dropped, obviously. And even though we still have the capacity, the participation has not matched pre-pandemic levels. It's going up, but it hadn't reached those levels yet. Let's talk about another uh, 
part of that, and, and, and that is public transportation, the Memphis Area Transit Authority, which, which ha has really been a long haul for you over, over eight years. You've, been, you've increased the city's funding for Memphis Area Transit Authority, and now there is this $30 million fund that is building as you leave office to reach that $30 million goal. Um, how, how much, pro how would you gauge the progress that, that has been made on that? Because it seems like we're still talking about a transit vision plan and there are setbacks along the way because if the ridership's not there, then MATA scales back some of the stops that they make. I think our funding has been significant and steady the increase. Uh, as you said, their budget was basically $30 million. It needs to be $60 million uh, in today's dollars. So uh, I'm very proud that for the first time ever we have a dedicated funding source and the county matched that. And by 2030 we will implement as a, in a, a slow build up to transit vision. Uh, now there'll be some loss in inflation, so city and county government could probably have to supplement it somewhat, but we're on the right track for the first time really ever. Uh, and uh, there is a plan out there on how to slowly implement transit vision. And uh, I think we need to hold MATA accountable for implementing those improvements. In short, it's more buses and more bus drivers on, on heavily used routes. And so that it doesn't take you an hour and a half to get from Fraser to Hickory Hill. Mm -hmm. Uh, is, there, is there some concern, though, that, that public transportation might be moving to things like light rail, even ride-sharing services, which, which, and, and rides by appointment, which MATA has had some great success with? Absolutely. And I think Transit Vision can, can do that. I do, light rail, I think, right now is, is unrealistic for Memphis actually expanding what we have now because it costs so much to implement it. And I've learned since being mayor, the feds used to pay 75% of that cost. Now it's down to 50%. So uh, I just don't see light rail. What I, I hope is more realistic is passenger rail from Memphis to Nashville. And I think there is some momentum there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, in, in terms of uh, uh, streets, I mean, it, it seems as if the more you put into streets, the greater need there is. And, 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 and I think if you didn't know it when you came in, you learned a, a, a lesson or two about funding for maintenance of this stuff once you get it yeah. done, right? Right. Yeah, I, I, I joke with people. I love the smell of freshly poured asphalt in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're going to take I do. that out. We're going to save that. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have increased paving 72%. Now, some people don't feel it, and there's reasons why, and we can get into that. But one of the things I think you're getting to is I learned since being mayor that potholes are a problem, and we fill potholes that are reported within like two days. The real bigger challenge is street cuts. When MLG and W or private vendors or even city government cut into the pavement. And we used to have a um, standard that if this, if this were the size of the street cut, you just pave it matching the corners of that. Well, that was a problem. It started sinking and there'd be gaps and it caused a problem. Now we require you to pave a bigger area. The old Catholic High, which I've forgotten what it's turned into now. It's a compass point. Compass point. It has a perfect example of the two things side by side. It has one that under the old standard, and you can see gaps and it's sinking, and one where it's paved under the new standard. It is much, the new standard will save us. Nobody cares in the public about this, uh, but I'm thinking you two might actually they're enjoy this. they watching this on Friday night, they it, care. That's true, that's they, true. The they, people who watch yeah. this are. But to me, it's one of those little known things that we did that I think over the long run will really improve the quality of our streets. Um, we'll stay with infrastructure and talk about MLGW. I mean, it's it's been a really hard year. Doug McGowan, your former COO, um, who'll be on the show in the next in a, a month or so, um, to talk about his first year in the new gig running MLGW, um, is had a lot of challenges, right? But one looking back, and we talked about some of those challenges last week when you were on. But looking back at the whole bidding process and the whole notion of leaving TVA 
and you know some people saying that there are hundreds of millions of dollars that could be saved if the city leaves MLGW leaves TVA maybe create works with MISO out of a co-op out of Arkansas and uh, across the river do you look back at that process and wish it had been done differently? You ultimately had to get your own consultant to kind of get to the bottom of what the, and it was unbelievably complicated. I mean, the whole deal and proposal was complicated. Um, I don't know if I'd do any differently, but we, we just got unlucky in the wrong time. I mean, bottom line is that's what Elaine Johns, our expert, basically said when she really dug into it. Inflation just took off so much that if there were these hundreds of millions of dollars of savings, they were kind of a, kind of eliminated. And bottom line, she said, you might want to do this later when the market, you know, settles down. And you know, that's for the future mayor and 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 Doug. But it was just, according to her, as my understanding, it, it was just bad timing, and therefore she couldn't recommend uh, uh, leaving TVA, but also strongly don't sign that long-term agreement with TVA because that's a never-ending thing. Let me also go with about six minutes left here. Um, the, people say Nashville, na and when they say Nashville, what they really mean, the legislature, they don't like us, the governor doesn't like us, they don't care about us in Memphis. I mean, that's all, I've heard that as long as we've been doing the show, as, pretty much as long as I've lived in Memphis. Um, what has been your experience working with state government? Uh, it's vastly improved. Uh, my first session, my first year as mayor was a session with uh, that marked uh, the effort to de-annex and I mean I've been in office for two months and 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 uh, they, it was a bill that would allow 20 percent of Memphis to de-annex themselves within a year and a half within a year and a half and it would have devastated Memphis and I was even told by a senator that the train has left the station we couldn't stop it we went up there full bore with the chamber and business leaders and we stopped it so we played defense now we we built relationships and now we've gotten to the point where we're getting offense. We are asking for things, truth in sentencing, money for uh, intervention and youth programming to help us with crime and, and uh, the big ask. And, and what we did was build relationships. Uh, three areas, Shelby County delegation, rural West Tennessee, and then leadership. One thing, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it before, but I, in December, I usually take two days off and travel rural West Tennessee and visit with senators and representatives and tell the Memphis story and build relationship. Life, politics, work is mostly relationship driven and you have to build that relationship and we as a team have done a really good job at that. Bring Bill in. Do legislators from other parts of the state regard this as a quote unquote blue city? I mean, you're a former chairman of the Shelby County Democratic Party. Uh, Absolutely. and. Um, but when you have a good relationship with somebody, you can disagree. I mean, I've disagreed with governors and legislators on guns, on the access to guns. I've just, but um, what I don't do is leave and then throw them under the bus, you know, personally attack them. I will say publicly I disagree with them, but I won't, you know, to be so personal in those attacks. And because yeah, that's what you, you don't do that when you have a relationship with them. So yeah, we have disagreements. I hate those, um, preemptive laws and they always have 30 or 40 of them every session and some of them have passed. And, and, and you've actually set up kind of a, a philosophy of which ones do we have the best chance of stopping. Correct, exactly. Um, our team uh, up, up in Nashville would say, well this one's not going anywhere so don't spend any time but these might pass. A good example is the Airbnbs. They preempted us and and it's very frustrating when citizens complain about Airbnbs and we can't do anything about it. Just a couple minutes left here. I, I'm going to guess you're not going to tell me the specific advice you've given Paul Young, who you've worked with. He was your yeah. original Housing and Community Development Director. He was at DMC, which you worked closely with. But you've spent a, quite a bit of time with him. What what sort of advice? What have you been able to share with him? Well, uh, share with us uh, <laughs> uh, a couple things. But my number one piece of advice, he was already on his radar, which is. It's great to have two and a half months as a transition, and the number one thing you have to do is hire good people. It's the number one thing. Uh, the part of your transition that's issue-oriented, uh, pe people are going to come up with policy papers, those help, but it's the people who execute on those things, and that's what's so important. And he's, he was already ahead of me, and we've, we went over all the issues. He's been working side-by-side -side with us on the stadium issues. Um, he's got somebody embedded up on the seventh floor to 
you know, see how we operate and what's going on. Transition teams are doing interviews in City Hall. He and I went to Nashville together to introduce him to the governor and other state officials and we got another trip planned. My rural West Tennessee, we're planning to do that together. Uh, and it's as smooth, we're trying to make it as smooth as possible. Uh, there's not enough time for this, but um, your best day as mayor. I don't know, I, this sounds corny, but I love this job so much that I don't know if I, it'd be hard to fi yeah. figure out one day. This is the greatest job in the world. It's the most stressful job in the world, but uh, I have loved it. Worst day? Well, there's several of those. Um, um, and uh, one of the things about being mayor is I have taken it, a, a sense of personal responsibility for every homicide uh, violent crime, COVID deaths, I really truly have felt a level of personal responsibility on that on a daily basis. And I've known people who've been killed and, um, and I've met parents of young people who've been killed and those are just heartbreaking um, meetings. Um, thanks for coming on. We think you're the most frequent guest going back to time as city council. We do really appreciate you being here and asking all these questions and talking things through. Um, we also know that you're the only guest who ever swore at me, <laughs> which, <laughs> but I don't hold that against you. So again, uh, thanks very much. Thanks for being here. Again, if you, we talked a bunch more about more current issues, a bunch more about crime last week on WKNO.org. You can get that episode or as a podcast, but thanks very much. Thank you, Bill. Join us again next week. Good night.